Uh, yes, just give me a minute. Okay. Um, a very warm welcome to everyone to the fourth foundation week of the Physics Society of Isa Tirunanthapuram, sponsored by Global Scientific with the support of School of Physics of Isa Tirunanthapuram. Today, we are here to participate in an insightful discussion with Dr. David Land into building international research software collaborations in the field of physics. Dr. David Lang is a computational scientist at Princeton University in New Jersey, USA, and CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. He's also one of the coordinators of the High Energy Physics Software Foundation. His expertise and passion promise to illuminate the intricacies of this fascinating subject. Before we start, I kindly request everyone here to stay on mute during the talk and save your questions till the end. Without further delay, Dr. Lang, the stage is yours. Hi, great. Thank you for the introduction. You hear me okay, just to double check? Okay, wonderful. Thanks. My I'm new to uh, uh, Google Meet, so hopefully this all goes well. So yeah, I, let me, I can start maybe by introducing myself a bit. Um, I'm a, a staff, research staff at Princeton University. And um, yeah, as we just mentioned, I actually reside here at CERN, uh, which is in Switzerland. And that's because that's where my where my scientific experiment is located. And I'll talk a bit more about why, you know, why that's so far away from Princeton and why um, I'm so excited to be there. Um, before I came to Princeton, I, I got a PhD in experimental particle physics um, from the University of California in Santa Barbara. Um, I then went on to, to be a postdoc and eventually staff member at Lawrence Livermore Lab during uh, basically 15 years. Um, the diagrams at the bottom are, are kind of the, uh, often the way we talk about our careers in hydrogen physics, that we move from one facility um, to another as different experiments become the state of the art experiments. And I have, have worked at the, the Clio experiment at Cornell the Babar experiment at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, and now the CMS experiment at CERN. And I'll, I'll talk a, a bit more about what about what these are as I as I go on. Um, so what I wanted to do today was talk about um, essentially my work that I've been involved with maybe for 20 years around uh, doing the, the software needed for very large experimental collaborations such as these. And the challenges in doing that, and more importantly, I think how this how we've evolved to sort of become more in tune with modern uh, software practices and and more collaborative approaches to to doing things. And the the punchline is that by by having evolved in that direction, we've become much more productive as a community and have a you know much more exciting uh, software ecosystem to work in. Um, so before I get there, I'll, I'll just introduce uh, particle physics in, in a few slides um, to give you some idea of what our experimental goals are. So I think if you if you think about how uh, physics physicists have have probed sort of ever smaller scales of of matter, you know, starting starting with with molecules which are made of atoms, and then you start understanding that atoms are made of of a nucleus and electrons. You know, then you understand that the nucleus is made of protons and neutrons, and eventually that protons and neutrons are made up of quarks. Um, and you know, so far today, quarks and electrons to us appear to have no dimensions. They look they look like point like particles that do not have any sub uh, substructure. But as you know, as uh, this progression from molecules to quarks has gone on, you see you you, you have ever smaller uh, constituents of matter, which conversely mean you need a more powerful microscope to see them. And in particle physics, a more powerful microscope means a more powerful particle accelerator. Um, so then th the way this then got cast into a, a, a more complete picture of fundamental particle physics is at first we thought we had essentially one family of electrons and quarks. 
and then a partner of an electron called a neutrino. Um, but then what was discovered in the 1930s was that there's a, essentially a, something that's like an electron, but, but heavier, that it, it shares a lot of the, the interaction, interactivity properties with an electron, but it's 200 times more massive and also is able to transverse uh, lots of material. Um, this is called the muon, and it was a big surprise at the time because it was uh, something that meant that there was probably a much richer family of, of particles than just sort of uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons out there. And sure enough, what's happened since, since then was a discovery of essentially three families of quarks and leptons and their antiparticles. So there's up, up and down quarks are what make up um, you know, the protons and neutrons that we're familiar with. But then there's two other families, a charm and strange quark, and top and bottom quark. And conversely, there's leptons, so the electron muon and, and tau muon, that you know, each row in this matrix share co common, common properties, and in particular their charge and their spin. And then each column is con considered a family of a family of particles. And what's what's particularly interesting is that these have all been uh, discovered experimentally. Most recently, the top quark, and the top quark was the hardest to discover because it's very massive. It has the mass of essentially a gold atom, 100, um, 173 GeV. Um, so, can, you know, conversely, an electron is only 0.5 MeV. So this is you know, five orders of magnitude difference in mass in, in this in, in these uh, in these particles, and that's leaving out the neutrino, which is essentially a massless or almost massless particle. Um, and so it's, it's kind of clear that this has taken a large uh, experimental program just because you need a very different accelerator to probe uh, the physics of top quarks than you did, say, to understand what an electron was or, or what a muon was uh, experimentally. Um, so these particles uh, sort of form the basis of matter as, as we understand it. Um, then conversely, they they interact via um, through an exchange of, of of other particles. It's sort of the quantum mechanics view. Um, is, I'm sure you're familiar with electromagnetic electromagnetism. It's uh, uh, essentially exchanged via the uh, the photon. There's also the way quarks interact via the strong force and then the weak force, which is mediated by the so-called uh, W and Z bosons, which were uh, which are like the top quark, quite massive and only only discovered, you know, in the, in the 80s. Uh, so this is all, you know, on the scale of, of science. These are the most recently understood um, particles in our in 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 particle physics. So the the weak force was is, has been historically something very complicated to understand, um, and you know, it's predict has been predicted and understood in the 70s, 80s, and 90s essentially. Um, and that's because it has a very short range. You have it only, only, uh, you know, only things within the, within a nucleus that are very close together within a proton or other particle are experience interactions via the weak force. So ten to the minus eighteen meters is something hard to hard to understand what that means, but it's a very very small length scale. And because of that, it was understood theoretically. Um, that the, the force carriers had to be very massive. And then uh, a consequence of that was that it was understood that then this picture of particle physics that I have on this previous page was not was not complete because if it were complete, then the theory wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't make sense that there's this consequence that the, you know, the quantum mechanical predictions was that sort of process where the this so-called W scattering, uh, process would would violate unitarity, and as a consequence, to build a, a consistent theory with the massive bosons that you needed, because you knew the weak force was very uh, had a very small range, that you needed some other particle, um, and that's the so-called Higgs boson. Uh, this was proposed in the 1960s by a number of people. That if you instead of having the diagram that was on the previous slide. You introduce this intermediate particle that he called the Higgs particle, uh, for just be named named after one of the theorists involved in in its prediction, 
that if you introduce this particle, it solves the problem on the previous page, that you no longer have this uh, unitarity breakdown, and you instead have what appears to be a, a self-consistent theoretical model. So, okay, it's up then to the experimentalist to, to uh, discover this particle or discover that it's not there and understand its properties. And that's what the uh, LHC experimental facility was built to test. Um, so the LHC is uh, an, a, an acronym for the Large Hadron Collider. It's here at, at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, so it's a very large uh, particle accelerator. It's, under, it's 100 meters underground, about 27 kilometers of circumference. And this picture is just an, an aerial view of the Geneva region. And to give you a perspective on the right is the Geneva airport, which is by no means a small airport. Um, so it, part, uh, what's done in this uh, particle accelerator is protons are accelerated up to uh, almost 14 TeV in center mass energy, uh, uh, are, uh, are go, go around this very large ring in both directions, and then at certain points, they collide. And what we do experimentally is build a large complicated apparatus to understand what happens when those protons collide. And so this uh, image is just showing where one of those collision points is out here in this part of the view. And there's there's four others around the ring that where each in each of them we've built an, um, a complicated experimental apparatus. And each each experiment is different. They have uh, different strengths and weaknesses. But somehow I'll focus just on one of them to show you kind of the idea of what our experimental um, app apparatus looks like. So this is the CMS detector, which is the one that I work on. And this is a, a cartoon version where there's a cutout. So it's really more like an, a, a completely spherical um, system. And this is a, a cutout view showing you from the inside out what it looks like. And it's very much like an onion, where what we're trying to do is detect all the particles that uh, come out of an interaction. So the interaction where the two protons come together is right here in, in the very middle of the diagram. And then there's a, a set of uh, detectors surrounding that point. And the idea of why you want to surround that point is so you can capture everything that comes out. And of course, you can't do that perfectly because uh, there's sort of the realities of how uh, these, these experiments are put together, that there's gaps. And there's also uh, where the, the protons themselves go down, down the so-called beam pipe, those hard to instrument that region as well. But the idea is to capture as much as you can of the sort of four pi solid angle in these detectors. And then they're, they're also onion-like for a different reason, which is that there's different layers of this detector going from sort of inside where you have very small precision uh, particle detectors to the outside where you're instead focused on making sure that you, that everything, no matter how high energy it is or how penetrating it is, that you're able to capture some signature that had happened. And for us, this starts with um, the technology is used is um, at the innermost part is this uh, silicon detectors where you've, you're able to essentially etch, the, etch and then instrument silicon wafers so that you can detect with sort of uh, ten, tens of micron precision where a particle might have gone through the silicon detector. Uh, and then the outermost layers are more like cal what we call calorimeters, which calo means sort of heat. And, and it's very much the idea is you try to you have enough material um, that essentially all particles that go through a calorimeter interact in some way, and it's a matter of then under, uh, un understanding what happened in, in the calorimeter, and that's why it's an, another you know, quite interesting area where you know, the idea is to capture as much energy as you can, but also localize it into a particular one particular spot so that you can say, okay, there's a some particle went over there, some particle went over there, and uh, separate the two and understand their properties. Um, so here's what our, a slice of our detector looks like in, in, in real life. So there are people in the diagram to give you some scale, but this is a very, you know, very, very uh, large system. It's sort of 25 meters tall, 20, 25 meters in length and weighs 14,000 tons. So something that's very heavy. Um, and what's shown in the in the middle of the diagram is uh, is is part of the innermost innermost silicon tracker, 
Um, and then sort of going out from there is the, the calorimeter and magnet part. And then and here are the, are the muon, the detectors for the muons. And you know, the reason muons were discovered in cosmic rays so easily is that they penetrate uh, lots of material. And so this, the, what, what's out here in the muon system is very dense material, sort of brass, for example, interleaved with detectors. And so you're able to basically sub, um, remove all the other particles and you're just left with muons, which are able to tra trans, uh, which are able to go through tens of centimeters of brass with no problem. And so you're left with just those to detect. So that's how this system works. Um, the other way it works is it requires lots of people. Um, cl clearly to build such a system requires many, many scientists and engineers and CMS has about 4,000 uh, scientists, engineers, technicians, and that's including almost a thousand PhD students. Um, and this is a, a worldwide endeavor from more, more than 40 countries and almost 200, 200 institutes. Um, so it's very much a, a big team science undertaking and relies on the sort of strengths from all over the, you know, scientific knowledge and strengths from all over the world to, to make this a success. So this CMS started taking uh, data in 20, well, essentially 2009. Um, and a few years later, in fact, they had enough data together with the Atlas experiment to um, essentially discover the Higgs particle. Um, this was announced at a, at a large scientific uh, seminar in, in 2012 and the Nobel Prize was awarded essentially for the work done by the theoretical community um, the following year. So this was a, you know, a quite nice success and a, a sign that we understand um, our model of particle physics and in, in particular that it needed some a particle that had the properties of a Higgs particle. And then we didn't know the mass and that we measured the mass to be 125 GeV. And what's happened since is that we're trying to understand much more about the Higgs particle. And one message to send as well, that's, it's not really the, the end of particle physics that we've discovered that discovered the Higgs boson. Instead, there's really a, a whole bunch of unanswered questions that we're you know, continuing to use the LHC to understand. And some examples of these questions are why why do neutrinos have mass? I didn't really talk about didn't really talk about that when I introduced the, all the particles of in particle physics, but neutrinos have a, a in our in the in the sort of theoretical model we're using have no mass, but in reality, we've measured them to have very small masses and we should understand how that can be part of our theory. Um, we don't understand why the top quark is so heavy and other particles are not so heavy. For example, uh, we know observationally that there's um, most of the matter in the universe we don't is not visible, it's so-called dark matter or dark energy. Um, there's a large asymmetry in how much matter versus antimatter we see. And also, we don't know why the Higgs mass is what it is. There's um, no, no particular reason in the standard model for it to have been 125 GeV rather than, say, a TeV. Um, so these are all things that are beyond our, our current understanding and our current model in particle physics from a theoretical standpoint. Um, and so searches to exploit, uh, you know, searches to exploit both precision measurements, which is say. You know, understanding precisely what the Higgs mass is or how it interacts with other particles, and also more search um, search like studies where you can try to use the highest energy scale to probe new, for new phenomena. These are sort of complementary ways of, of extending our knowledge in particle physics, and both are really important. Um, so that's kind of my segue then into into talking more generically about facilities and, and the software needed to do them. Um, this is a diagram over time of particle physics facilities. And the reason I wanted to show it was that just to show you that over time, what happens is you try to get more and more energetic facilities so you can probe uh, smaller and smaller length scales and higher mass scales. So you're, you need a, 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 so for example, the Tevatron discovered the top quark but it did not have enough energy to discover the Higgs particle. And that's why we then moved to the LHC facility, which had a higher 
uh, collision energy. So the protons were accelerated to higher uh, momenta and had enough energy to discover this uh, more higher mass particle. The blue, just to show you, is, is the lepton colliders. And that's where I'm talking about doing precision measurements that uh, these colliders, even if they're lower in energy than, say, the, the something uh, hadron collider are very capable for other reasons. And the success of that, of this sort of facility model, where you have a very, you, you, you build a cutting edge high energy facility and then exploit it, it has been very successful. That we, that here's, here's again the three families of, of uh, fermions, or quarks, and leptons, and then uh, up, down, uh, strange charm top and bottom and then the the force carriers that i talked about at the beginning of the talk um and the, and then what's mapped on top here is how which facility each one has been discovered at and, and you can see that there's in the end you you typically have facilities make one really important discovery each and then you move to another facility either to study that uh, what you've just discovered or discover the next the next uh, interesting particle. Um, and just with facilities, so I've talked really about detectors so far, right? But now, but just as facilities, we now rely on very large computing infrastructures uh, to do this science. So on, on the left, this is a graphical display of what one of our um, detector events looks like, that there's um, a lot, Lots of different measurements, and just looking at it, you can't tell you can't tell what went on in, in this event. You need to do some some analysis to reconstruct each particle, and then determine from that reconstruction what what actually happened in the underlying event. And to go from that to what we publish, which are diagrams like this one, where you say, "Ah, here I have in blue what I expected if there was no Higgs particle." And the points are what I observed from my experiment that you can see, oh, there's without this extra red contribution, my data does not match my prediction. The doing going from the left to the right in this diagram requires a substantial software and computing infrastructure. And that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, and to give some examples of what this software is doing. So at the LHC, we're collecting data at 60 terabytes a second. Um, we can't possibly save that much data to look at later. We have to make uh, a real-time data reduction. We're able to save about five gigabytes a second by going down the sort of five orders of magnitude happens in real time. We have microseconds uh, to make that decision. Um, then once we have this, this data, uh, we're looking, doing pattern recognition, basically going from a very, uh, very low level information that says a particle that you know, the detectors basically say something went by this lo this uh, this location putting those together to make particle trajectories that say okay uh, some ch particle with a charge went went in this direction it's called reconstruction so it's a very traditional pattern recognition uh sort of application um and then from there you uh, you Put together all of the trajectories, and you understand, and then you understand via an analysis what actually happened. So, looking for signatures that there was a Higgs decay, or uh, other model, you know, another beyond the standard model that type particle. Um, in parallel, we have uh, uh, we do this. We have our real detector data, but we also have what we call simulations, where you're 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 starting with what a physical process predicted by some theoretical uh, group might have might have suggested to you as being a new physics process and then understanding what that what that physics process would look like in our detector and it's it's the combination of the real detector data this pattern recognition and the simulation that lets the, our analysis actually happen and so you can understand that that's uh, quite quite a, a complicated process and to do this we're using uh, a distributed computing system where like the like the experiment we're using computing located throughout the world um, 
similar numbers to our experiment, right? There's 170 data centers, 42 countries. And this is uh, the sort of computing that lets us get all of our science done. And the scale is a million, roughly a million CPU cores and, and hundreds and uh, about a thousand petabytes of, of data stored. Um, so these are you know, not the scale of uh, sort of Google Cloud or, or Amazon Cloud sort of systems, but uh, for science, these are very large, large scale computing. Um, so given that perspective, I'll talk about some of the uh, challenges we have. Um, what Going from sort of a first design of what CMS might look like to being done with data is, is a career, even more than that now. It, our CMS as an experiment is 30 years, was conceived 30 years ago. It started taking data and will take data for another 15 years. Um, and beyond that, there'll be analysis. And clearly you have to have software for that entire, that entire time span. And they give an example of why that's hard, right? Is that the soft, the computing that we had at the beginning of CMS is very different from what we'll have when CMS ends, right? For example, we've already seen the end of, of Denard scaling that we now have to write code that's very parallel. We have, um, our applications have gone from single threaded to multi-threaded um, sort of in, the, in around 2015. And today's challenge is we, we need to stop using only CPUs, but to use you know, GPUs. And, and it's because the sort of performance of GPUs is tripling every 18 months. So they're clearly going to be you know, the, the most cost effective way of doing computing in the very near future. And we need to be ready for that. But that's not something we could have possibly anticipated when we started CMS uh, quite some time ago. So it's a sign that uh, software needs to be pretty agile. It, we need to have a sort of a design that, uh, just like the facility itself, we need to un, we need to design the software and think of it as and think of it as infrastructure and understand how to develop a scientific software that serves serves the mission the 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 task at hand today, but also where we where we think we'll be in say ten years, right? That we you need to think of the whole life scale of your system. Yeah, and one thing that makes it hard is you have lots of developers. This is uh, this is an, an example. We have hun hundreds of people contributing code every month. Um, instead, there's only a handful of true experts of our software in, in CMS. So you have this sort of duality of lots of contributors every month and a handful of experts um, that deal with uh, you know putting together, uh, making the whole thing work together as as one system. Um, and it's millions of lines of code that this is uh, the mainly focus on the yellow diagram here, but there's um, around 6 million lines of code to do our event reconstruction and our simulation in CMS. And there's probably tens of millions of other code that we rely on. Uh, but this is just to give you the scale of what those hundreds, those hundreds of developers on the previous page are, you know, in the end have built a, quite a complicated uh, software system. We also have the challenge that um, to do more physics, we're always trying to uh, build a better detector or a better uh, facility. And there's a big upgrade coming to CMS and to the entire LHC facility, the so-called uh, high luminosity LHC, which is going to uh, make our, uh, basically have five times as many protons as we have today. So that means that uh, whenever our protons collide, we will have 200 interactions happening, and we'll have to understand which of those 200 is interesting, um, and which particles are from which of the 200 uh, interactions. Um, this is very much a needle and haystack sort of sort of problem. We have a, a lot, of, lot of data, and only a little bit of it is interesting. Um, and the analysis community has to adapt as, in the same way, that their software needs to be prepared for, for higher rates, higher event complexity, and, and better detectors. Um, and what this means for our computing, this is a kind of a kind of a strange chart, but the, the point of it is that over time, the blue lines are estimating how much CPU we need or how much disk we need um, to do our science. And there's a big jump coming at the end of the decade um, that we're going to have. We're going to need say five times as much computing, but our 
or the budget to buy this computing is not going to go up by the same factor, right? So we need to rely on technology evolution. I talked about GPUs as one example, um, and also new ideas to make our, uh, you know, to make things go faster or to use less storage to, to store our data. Um, one example of that is that we're trying to understand me mechanisms to make our analysis go faster, kind of going from thinking about doing analysis where a user is using their laptop to instead where a user is using an analysis facility that would let them uh, scale to very high high levels of compute, but also use things like modern machine learning um, and, re and reproducible uh, methods without having to develop them themselves, right? Um, and you know, reproducibility is another important aspect. And I think the main point of this slide is you know, things like reproducibility, uh, open source software, are very important, and uh, and we've realized this over the last decade that um, understanding how to make uh, it easy for our scientists to engage in the open source community, have be able to reproduce the results, is actually a pretty challenging problem and really important. That uh, you know, for our future, we definitely would like to be able to reproduce results that we have today. Um, so I kind of talked about this already, but you know the idea in our software is that we've had a quite a nice success over the last decade by thinking about software as something that enables science and it's something that we need to design, not just sort of, you know, when I, when I was a student, I kind of felt like we uh, experiments developed software kind of at the last minute. It's like, oh, let's, let's, uh, we now have our detector running. Let's start thinking about the software needed to, to, to run the detector and now it is, I think, becoming the scale of what we're doing is, has changed such that it's important to, from the beginning, think about how the software needs to be integrated into our into our facility. And that's why I think a much more interesting uh, system than it used to be. So I'm see I'm talking too long, but I have a, a few examples of kind of successes in our software, and then how we're using uh, software to, to make also our science better. You know, one example uh, that's come out of high energy physics is we have these very detailed detector simulations um, to to do the sort of deep we are to do our physics. We need to model how particles interact with our very detailed instruments, and the same technology is is gotten put to use in in medical physics applications, right? So for cancer treatments and other and other systems, you need the same sort of precision. So for example, treating Treating humans, you want to minimize the dose you're giving give, giving to a patient while maximizing the you know, effect on their cancer in this in this case. Um, and and these so this tool we've developed called Jan4 has uh, been is now pretty widely used in in the medical community. It was something developed completely in hygiene physics. Uh, another example is having such large code bases. We like to do as much as we can interactively. Uh, so hydrogen physicists uh, pioneered uh, interactive C++ programming in environment, which in the, in the end lets you do the kind of things you see on the right, which is you go into a Jupyter notebook, you can run interactively C++, change it, change into Python to do plotting. And so and the idea here is by doing things interactively and also by letting people use the language they want or the language that's good at doing something, that you make it easier to do rapid application development, even if your code base is large and complex. It's very, very much a productivity of researcher question. Um, and then the last example, which I'll, I have a few slides on, is sort of in more in the other direction, where we believe that the data science community is actually quite broad, and and, and we've uh, you know, understood that the Python ecosystem that's developed which in some sense is centered around Python, but then you build packages for either for, for data analysis, data visualization, and, and more and more specialized systems that we've, we've sort of over the past five years developed the same system in high energy physics. And there, I'll talk about the reason why we couldn't just use the one, uh, the ecosystem in the uh, sort of the scientific Python ecosystem which is that we don't have sort of rectilinear data. Our data looks kind of like this ugly, this ugly example that we have lists of lists of what we call events. Some events have 
lots of muons. Some events have lots of electrons. And so it's very different from an image where you always have the same number of pixels in, in, in all dimensions. We have data that where the dimensionality will change. And so what if you were just to use a naive Python, you'd, you'd, you'd write code to analyze this data structure. You'd end up with code on the left. And instead, we've developed in time um, a, a system that basically takes, takes this uh, rather ugly data structure and flattens it and then does the analysis on it. And the benefit of doing this is that by developing essentially a, a generalized tool for manipulating JSON, like structures, we've sped up um, we've sped up our analysis code by you know from minutes to seconds. Um, another another way of more complete picture is this one where maybe focus on the on the right side of the diagram where, where we were uh, yeah say mid mid say 2015 is somewhere up here that in this very simple um, cal calculation which is basically a coordinate transformation. Um, not something you want to wait for, but on a large data set, it took hundreds of seconds. And over time, we've de by uh, developing better and better tools, we've gotten this down to well under a tenth of a second, right? And that's really, uh, if you're an analyst, having to wait from minutes to having something that's done before you can think about your next question um, is really a, a, a life-changing, life well, not life-changing, but work-changing um, uh, uh, mod modification to the way you're doing analysis, right? If you have to wait uh, long periods of time to get answers back, then your productivity is much lower than if you get the answer back right after you ask the question. Um, and very much in that spirit, the idea now we're working towards taking these tools and where that and instead integrating them into an analysis facility where by having the software and hardware or the code design that we're able to in increase further the productivity of our researchers. Okay, my last uh, two slides were on a project which is maybe part of why why, why you asked me here. Uh, one one thing I, I wanted to build was that you know, this is very much needs to be a global a global undertaking, just like the rest of our experiments are very global. Um, and one thing. This and for reasons uh, that I that I don't know why anyway the way our software has been developed over time has largely been in the U.S. and in Europe, um, and so we actually given that started working with people in India and got a project funded from the U.S. government to essentially start to bridge uh, making our research software even more international and engaging engaging India-based researchers. Um, and this is very much intended as a, or a long-term investment in inter international, what we call international team science. Um, and different from a typical project, which has, you know, typically you, you get funded to, to build something or to write some code. This, this project is quite different. It's really meant to facilitate collaborations. And I'll talk about a few examples that we're doing uh, sort of training events and doing research exchanges where the idea is to get people working together on research software. Um, I'll actually skip over this diagram, but just to talk about uh, one of the things we've done is have training uh, called, we're calling them software workshops, but it's basically week long uh, tutorials on different software use in energy physics. And these are you know, targeting PhD students primarily, the ones who are you know, kind of decided to do particle physics. That's how our lectures are basically designed. And these have turned into a mix of uh, researchers from India and researchers from the US being instructors and uh, are basically half interactive and half lectures. So they're, I think, taking a different style of, of, of learning than, than most courses I've seen doing software, which tend to be much more lecture oriented. You know, we're trying to make sure people also uh, understand and interact with uh, what, we're, what we're doing. Um, the other example program we're we have is a, we're calling a summer project fellows program. Um, it's actually more flexible than, than just summer, just because everybody has a different academic calendar, um, where the idea is to bring students in contact with mentors to work on a, on a predefined project around software to both develop their software skills and to sort of give them experience of working in large projects 
in a collaboration, essentially. Um, and these are meant to be short term projects that maybe then become longer term, longer term projects as, as the student progresses uh, through their career. Um, and just as an advertisement, the 2024 program uh, is open and the way to find out about it is to follow the link on my conclusion slide, uh, which I'll just conclude by, you know, kind of summarizing what I, my, my point of talking today, which is that, you know, in particle physics, we have large international teams of scientists. And that's what allows us to do the experiments um, to you know, probe these ever ever smaller scales of uh, particle interactions. Um, and these exploit regional strengths. And we want to do the kind of get to the point where we have the same, same environment in research software that we have truly international software teams that are able to develop you know, very performant, highly usable, sustainable uh, software for our experiments. And we think there's a big long-term payoff there that by, by getting to that point, we'll have very sustainable uh, software and that we'll be able to, you know, that we'll be able to deal with the fact that we have very long experimental lifetimes where the, the developer community is changing, they have large code bases, and they rely on a, a evolving distributed computing system that I, I think is a pretty, pretty unique to particle physics um, in our in our community, and I think it's a, a very interesting challenge. So thank you for thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. La, for keeping us all engaged throughout the session with your wisdom. It was truly a privilege. If anybody has any questions, please unmute your microphone and ask them, or put them in the chat box. Yeah. Hi, David. Uh, nice talk. Uh, I had a question. It might be very general to all forms of scientific, like computing in when it comes to science and all. Uh, so you generate a huge amount of data on a very daily basis, like even in one run of LHC, it's like a uh, very huge amount of data that can be like uh, storing it would be a very very big problem and challenge like even storing it for longer time like you don't want the data you collect today to get erased tomorrow or day after you want the data to be stayed for uh, like to stay for longer time so how do you tackle out these problems because storage locations again like building up uh, storage locations across country and that might be again very expensive and like space consuming right so it, it is um and I think there's two aspects. One is we try to store um, quote unquote interesting data and we try to do so in a very compressed way. Um, and the word interesting, of course, is a, is a time dependent um, thing because what science is interesting today may not be interesting um, tomorrow. Uh, but we have to make our best guess about keep you know, which 0.1% or 0.01% of our data is most interesting that's, that we can afford to keep. Um, then uh, in terms of, yeah, the, I think the other aspect is, right, we'd like to keep our data, well, in some sense forever. I, I think being able to for sure have it on, on the timescale of many decades I think it is pretty important. Um, we, we see examples from Pre previous experiments where people are still going back to data taken 30 years ago and analyzing it. Um, and there's of course no perfect storage technology, but what, what you can do is build in redundancy to your, to your system. And that's actually where being a global infrastructure is, is a big advantage. We, store, uh, we essentially store all of our data at CERN, um, but we also, store a copy of it somewhere else in the world. Um, and that, that means even if the, you know, even if the CERN computing center were to have a, a problem and lose data that we, we still have it somewhere else. Um, that of course does double the cost in some sense, um, just because you were putting, we're putting data on a tape medium and you have to pay the, the tape costs and that, that is what it is. Um, but it gives you the luxury of having uh, 
an insurance policy essentially that you're not going to lose you're not going to lose some precious data because of a computing center issue um, but I, I think scientifically the more interesting continuous challenge for us is, is selecting which data to keep uh, that we have we have a budget uh, for storage and we're of course doing our best to increase it but it uh, it, it does mean we're selecting uh, yeah, say 0.01% of our data, um, which is a big, uh, which keeps a lot of people busy understanding which which, which data we should keep, let's say. Did, did, that answer, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah that, that's helpful. Thanks. Cool. So does anybody have any more questions? Uh, since there are no more questions, I'd like to thank Dr. Lang again. Um, it was truly a privilege. And stay tuned for more events from the Foundation Week. Well, thank you again.